Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. So let's see, what are we up to here? <laughs> Our real goal is try to figure out how to avoid uh, natural selection. And we need to, folks. Uh, this, this film may be shown later, and I'll just tell those who aren't watching this in February, it's February, when this lecture has been given. And there's defense and suffering in Ann Arbor this very day. This is the weather report starting yesterday. <laughs> Here we are about 10 a.m. on Saturday, eight degrees, and the forecast shows that the weather, the temperature is going to go steadily down, 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 until at about 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, it'll be zero. And then summer will begin again. <laughs> uh, and soon we'll be up to 22 degrees. This is not pleasant. Why isn't it pleasant? Shouldn't we just be evolved to cope with this kind of thing? No, it's very, very unpleasant. What happens? We shiver. Could you tell that you shiver without getting cold? I mean, you could live you know, 20 years in someplace very warm and never shiver. You don't know you have that capacity until it happens. And you come out to a lecture like this on a day like this, dressed as if it was last week, and you shiver. There are two kinds of shivering, type one and type two. Your muscles are designed to do these very uncomfortable things, and it's designed to be quite uncomfortable. How do we understand this kind of capacity like shivering? And most of all, how much shivering is best? <laughs> There's a wide variety of shiverers. There are some people who shiver a great deal, and some people don't shiver very much at all. Some people shiver too much. The least little breath of cold air will get them shivering. They're unpleasant even in air conditioning in the winter, summer. Some people have too little shivering, and now it gets kind of serious, actually, because this is a picture of a body that the Park Service found. Not here, thanks goodness, although we do lose several people in this town every year from cold. Is that the amount that's just right? We're going to try to answer this kind of question in this lecture, but we need some theory to do it with. And that starts back at Carleton College. Uh, my colleagues from the Carleton Club will appreciate Olin Hall, where I took a course from a fellow named Patrick Milburn in 1960. Oh, that's really what Carleton was like, by the way, uh, at this time of year. There was lots of time for studying. Uh, or sometimes maybe this is just the interdisciplinary road. Uh, interdisciplinary road is kind of cold and long and so in that sophomore class, he said, write a paper about whatever you want to. And being you know, very naive, I thought, well, I'll try to figure out why there is aging at all. It turned out that was a pretty good question. Um, it's very highly heritable. <laughs> big relations, big differences, and very closely related species. So why didn't natural selection fix it? Why didn't natural selection increase the frequency of genes that make individuals live a long time? I came up with what I thought was a fabulous idea. I wrote the paper about it and said, maybe it's to ensure a turnover of individuals so the species can evolve if the climate changes. It's a perfect sophomore kind of idea. <laughs> and it was, my one professor said, this is the best paper I've written in years, A plus. And he gave it to the chairman of the department. The chairman says, you shouldn't pass this. This is an error. But he couldn't quite say what it was. Well, that's kind of heady stuff for a sophomore, you know? You think, hey, these guys don't have it all answered already. So I went to medical school. And there again, I asked, so why is there aging? It was different there. They said, well, things wear out, obviously. And natural selection isn't all that great. And besides, stop asking questions and memorize more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> then I started hanging out with evolutionary biologists at this wonderful, wonderful place, the museum. You think the museum is just for stuffed things? It's not. It's a place where scientists work and talk, and it was the entire inspiration for all of my life's work in this area. I found out there were questions like, why do organisms do what they do evolutionarily? Why is there sex at all? Why are some species social while others aren't? These are great questions. So I asked my question, 
I said, so why is there aging to this group? Very casually one time. And Bobby Lowe, a professor here in the School of Natural Resources and active evolutionary biologist, said very politely, what? You've never read Williams 1957? <laughs> um, that was a wonderful, mean thing she did to me, actually. I went home that night and read Williams 1957 and realized that my entire education had only used half of biology. I learned all kinds of things about how the mechanisms worked. I'd learned nothing about why they were the way they were, and it was about time to get going. So I studied natural selection and read all the textbooks and other things and subscribed to the journals. Natural selection turns out to be actually not that complicated. Whenever there's heritable variation in a trait that influences reproductive success, the trait has to change over the generations. And it does these marvelous things like making bird beaks that are just exactly what's needed for getting the kind of food that that species eats. In fact, selection turns out to be everywhere. Forget about natural selection for a moment. Let's just talk about selection. You all, in fact, were a selective process this morning. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. I saw people coming in here at 10.15, and the only thing left were bagels, <laughs> plain bagels. All the better things had been selected out long before. <laughs> Anybody have a jar at home where you throw your change out of your pockets? And then in the morning, you need some more change, so you take it out? What happens? It starts off from a mixture of silver and brown coins. And then steadily, as the month goes by, it's almost all brown until you have to take it to the grocery store and dump it in one of those things that steals 10%. <laughs> Why is what's on TV on TV? They throw everything up there, folks. Everything you can imagine gets on TV, and whatever we watch is there. I think we don't really need to do psychology anymore because the ultimate psychological experiment for whole world has been done. They've, we've done a selection process to see what people will watch, and that's what we watch. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> um, Whatever is in the grocery store, you know those aisles you don't want to go down because there's nothing healthy in them? Mm -hmm. Only reason they're there is because we buy them. And then there's what politicians say. And they'll say almost anything, and whatever doesn't offend too many people, they'll say it again. <laughs> And then there are genes and organisms. This is a different kind of selection. This is natural selection. But it's just a specialized kind of these other kinds of selection where you explain what a population is like now based on what it was like before and the fact that some variants were more likely to get into future generations. Now we come to the body. First years of medical school, anyone who doesn't come away with a sense of absolute awe is not paying attention. You look at the eye with the, clear, the only clear tissue in the body, the heart, the nephron, and the kidney, and how it works, clotting regulation mechanisms. I mean, you just have to come away saying, it's hard to believe that natural selection could actually do all this. And then you get to the clinic. Horror at the body's flaws. You, any of you, even those who have never studied biology, even physicists, um, <laughs> could do better in a single afternoon. What would you do? First thing, eliminate the appendix. You don't need it. It's liable to kill you. Second, wisdom teeth. Do you want wisdom teeth? Uh, how many people have had their wisdom? No. We do not need these, thank you. Um, you, you turn the eye inside out so that you don't have a blind spot anymore and so the vessels and nerves don't run between the light and the image, or a really bad design. You would make the bones stronger, certainly, and you'd make the immune responses stronger, and you would make the blood clot slow more slowly so you don't get so many heart attacks. You would let the heart get blood from its chambers, right? Heart attacks are so silly uh, because the blood has to go through the aorta and through these little tiny arteries on the outside. Why not just get some blood from the inside? And finally, you'd install a zipper. <laughs> So babies can exit so much more easily. So why has natural selection left the body so vulnerable? Parts of it are so exquisite, it's just fabulous. It's like Mercedes engineers did the job. And then other parts of it, however, are botched jobs, and it's as if those Mercedes engineers worked their 32-hour German week, went out for beer, and left it to the Yugo engineers <laughs> to finish the job. Why? How can it be that something so perfect can also have so many flaws? Of course, the answer is a natural selection. An easy mistake to make is to think that diseases were shaped by natural selection. And when George Williams and I first worked on this, that's how we thought about it. 
And I think the big thing that we accomplished is so simple. We said, no, it's not diseases. It's vulnerabilities we're trying to explain. We're trying to explain why isn't the body better designed? Why is it left vulnerable by natural selection? And in the process, we realized that natural selection isn't just for explaining why things work well. It's also for explaining why things don't work so well. And we kind of turned Darwinian medicine. A lot of people give me a hard time about this term. And they say, why didn't you call it evolutionary medicine? Well, because I argued with George Williams for six hours about it, and he won. Uh, he pointed out that evolution just means change over time. Darwinian implies the actions of natural selection. And even though Darwinian has come to have a kind of a nasty connotation, it's a more accurate term. Is this radical? No, there's nothing radical about it. It's just applying plain old evolutionary biology to the problems of medicine. Is it a way of treating patients? No. I keep getting these calls from alternative medicine societies saying, will you speak to us? Will you tell us about Darwinian medicine being an alternative source of medicine? No. Um, all it is is adding a basic science to medicine. This is the article that George Williams and I wrote. And I'm emphasizing this because he's one of the world's renowned evolutionary biologists, taught me much of what I wouldn't know, most of what I know. And it's just been a pleasure. Much of what I'm talking about is thanks to him. Uh, so we published this article in 91 and subsequently published a book that's gotten quite popular. And one of the great pleasures is that this has turned out to be the basis for courses all over the place. Every single biology student in the first year bio course at Albion reads our little book. Uh, they kind of like it. And there are courses on evolution and medicine in 40 or 50 uh, colleges in this country and all over the world. Programs in evolution medicine starting at University College London, University of British Columbia, uh, we hope, um, and uh, Louisville. So it's getting going very nicely. And actually, David Mendel and I taught a large undergraduate course, had 100 kids in it with Alan Weeder uh, about five years ago through special interdisciplinary life sciences funding. It was wonderful. Uh, he took off and ran the museum. And since then, Alan Weeder and I have run the course and had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, the, the money for that's gone. And we hope the new provost or someone can help us find a way to continue that teaching at some time in the future. This picture of George Williams is the tall fellow, Abraham Lincoln-esque. Uh, along with John Maynard Smith and Ernst Meyer when they got their Crawford Award in 1999. That's the Nobel Prize for biology, basically. And Ernst Meyer also was an inspiration. In his book, The Growth of Biological Thought, he points out that no biological problem is solved until both the proximate and the evolutionary causation is elucidated. Furthermore, the study of evolutionary causes is as legitimate a part of biology as is the study of the usually physical chemical proximate causes. So what do we do in medicine? One could say you do one half of biology, because we don't ask evolutionary questions about why the body isn't better designed. And George and I have been encouraging people to ask new questions about disease, not why one person gets sick, not how the mechanism works. We're asking a different question, that is why we all share vulnerabilities. Why didn't natural selection do better? The answer I was taught in medical school is, well, natural selection isn't that good. What do you expect? And that's absolutely correct. That's one explanation. But there are five more that we should consider as well. Here they are. And uh, no details here, OK? Just really quickly, mismatch. We're in the wrong environment. Two, competition with fast evolving organisms. That basically means infection. They evolve faster than we do. Three, every trait is a trade off, so nothing can be perfect. Four, there are a lot of things natural selection can't do. That's the old explanation. Five, organisms are not shaped for health. They're shaped for reproductive success. And finally, defenses and suffering. And you can see we're getting to today's topic. If, you'd ra if you're a lumper, there are, these can be lumped. Selection is slow. There are a lot of things selection can't do. And the last two are actually areas that we misunderstand. We think defenses and suffering are abnormal, but in fact, they're useful. Today, we're just talking about defenses and suffering. So what are these things? They're latent capacities shaped by natural selection expressed only when needed. And their expression is regulated. You don't shiver all the time. You only shiver when it's cold out and you're not wearing warm enough clothes. Examples, nausea, vomiting, cough, fever, diarrhea, anxiety, jealousy. There are two kinds of problems that doctors see. And some doctors are not entirely clear about this, actually. A lot of the problems you see in the clinic are direct manifestations of a defect. Seizures, cancer, paralysis, jaundice, and injury. Something's wrong, and it's directly there. It's like when you're driving down the road and your transmission starts going clankety, clankety, clank. Nobody designed it to go clankety, clankety, clanky. It just does. On the other hand, other problems that we bring to our doctors are defenses. Fever, cough, pain, fatigue, and anxiety. They're not like the clankety, clank, clank, clank. They're like the oil light going on. 
Somebody designed a system to detect something going wrong and set off a protective response. Now, when your oil light goes on and you're on the expressway, you know that you should stop and check it. And now you stop at a local gas station and a very nice young man says, oh, your oil light's on? I, I can fix that. It won't bother you anymore. I've got a wire clippers right here. <laughs> but wait a second. Now you go to your doctor and you say, you know, I'm, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I have a fever. And your doctor says, no problem. We've got a drug that can block your fever and help you feel better. Is that a good idea? No. Well, don't be so quick to say no. This needs a subtle evolutionary analysis before we should answer this question. How are these defenses regulated? It seems like they're not really necessary, actually, because we can block them safely. Um, you can take some Tylenol for your fever, and you're very unlikely to die from that infection. So does selection just make a mistake? And another related question, well, why are these things so unpleasant? Why can't we just shiver without hating it? Why can't we just vomit without it bothering us so much. Of course, then you think, why can't we be anxious without being anxious? Uh, why can't we feel pain without feeling pain? Yeah, that's harder. What about pain? Great example. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live without pain ever? There are people who do this, but there's a problem. They don't live very long. They die because they don't have pain. The capacity for pain is useful. When you experience it, it means something's wrong. But the capacity is useful. There are a lot of fixed defenses, like skin and things that are just there all the time. Those aren't our topic for today. Our topic are inducible defenses. And I refer you to wonderful work by these guys, uh, Tolerant especially in Harville. They're latent traits, meaning that they're hidden, like you're shivering. You don't know you can shiver until it's cold out. And they come on when they're needed if the regulation mechanisms are working right. Uh, Tolleran's wonderful book on inducible defenses studies Daphnia, water fleas. And when they're in the presence of other little things that eat them, they make these sharp pointed rigid helmets to prevent themselves from being eaten. When they aren't in that situation, they don't bother growing such helmets. Very nice example of facultative adaptation. A facultative adaptation is just one that's only there when it's needed. How about stress? You've heard hundreds of lectures and articles about stress is bad for you. So why is it there at all if it's so bad for us? What happens to people who don't have any capacity for a stress system, whose adrenal glands aren't working right? They go into surgery, and they're liable to die. They get a minor cold, and if they don't have cortisol, they're liable to die. We need the right amount of stress, not too much or too little. So if stress is so useful, why don't we have more of it all the time? Well, first of all, a lot of us do. Um, but there are three other reasons. It consumes energy, decreases the ability to do other things, and most of all, it damages tissues. So why can't it be designed to not damage tissues? Well, because the things are packaged into the stress response because those are the exact things that are so dangerous that they can't be there all the time. They should only be expressed at times when it's worth it. You don't wear body armor you know, to mow your lawn, uh, but at other times it might be worth it. How about fever? The nicest work ever on fever was done here by a physiologist named Matthew Kluger. And he studied lizards and let them go closer. You wouldn't think of fever in a cold-blooded animal, right? But in fact, they use body temperature regulation very nicely. When they get injected with a bacteria, they go closer to light. And if you don't let them close to the light, they're very likely to die. Now you probably want to know, if should I take Tylenol for my own influenza? Here's an odd one for you. There's no good study on that that I know of. This is almost the most common question anybody ever asked their doctor. And it's a study that any you know, master's degree student could do at the health service here. Never been done exactly quite right. <coughs> Diarrhea. This one's pretty clear. DuPont has done some lovely studies showing that giving low modal for people who have a serious kind of diarrhea called Shigella is liable to prolong it and lead to, you know, lead to complications. Very bad idea. Now you want to know, hey, I'm going on spring break next week. What if I catch something? Should I take low modal? I wish the studies would be done very soon. Isn't it odd that such obvious, obvious things haven't been done long ago? Anxiety, which is a lot of my business, it's really useful to escape. And going all over the country giving talks about anxiety, I would always ask my colleagues, can you show me any article that shows that anxiety is useful instead of useless? Never found it, but I finally found an article by a guy named Poulan who studied kids who had a fear of heights, actually, or not a fear of heights. There was kids who were brought into the emergency room before the age of three because of a bad fall. He followed them up at age 18 to see if that, fear, if that fall had developed a fear of heights in these kids. 
and guess what? The kids who had fallen had a rate of height phobia of under 2%. The kids who had not fallen had a height phobia rate of about 13%. These kids didn't have enough sense to quit calling on the dining room table when they were two, and they still don't have any height phobia. <laughs> They have hypophobia, a disease that's very common but does not show up often in a psychiatrist's office. So with all of this, it's looking pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, natural selection has shaped all these devices that make us very unhappy whenever anything bad happens, and we suffer as a result. It's ancient wisdom, isn't it? The first noble truth, life is suffering. It gets worse, actually, though. Schopenhauer said it best of all, an early kind of quasi-evolutionist, if the immediate and direct purpose of our life is not suffering, he says, then our existence is the most ill-adapted to its purpose in the world. Now, we psychiatrists, I'm afraid, have a very biased view of life. Uh, it seems even worse than it is. Um, if you see people all day who get themselves in one kind of jam or another suffering from some kind of mental disorder, it's almost like despair. It's always <laughs> darkest to be. <laughs> Before it goes pitch black. <laughs> Darwin had some equanimity about this, though. He says, pain or suffering of any kind, if long continued, causes depression and lessens the power of action. Yet it's well adapted to make a creature guard itself about any great or sudden evil. And more recently, Ed Wilson says, love joins hate, aggression, fear, expansiveness, withdrawal, and so on, in blends designed not to promote the happiness of the individual, but to favor the maximum transmission of the controlling genes. I read this in 1976 while I was treating people on the inpatient ward, and all of a sudden I realized that all these emotions and other things I was seeing were not there because of the benefit to the individual. They were there because they benefited genes. Talk about something everybody in the field should know and not many people do. This led me to coin this little phrase called the clinician's illusion. These things, fever, pain, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, they seem like problems, but that's an illusion. They actually are not problems, they're defenses. They can be dangerous, but they're expressed when there's a problem. They're painful, and blocking them is often safe. This gives the illusion that these things are actually defects when they are not. Here's a knowledge gap illustrated. Again, you'd think that I'm just complaining about something now. This is a, the award-winning paper in biological psychiatry in 2003. And just notice a sentence from that paper. It's a wonderful paper, I must say. I, I admire the author greatly, except for this. Uh, rats exposed to a cat for 10 minutes. Our results showed that a single 10-minute exposure to a predator significantly enhanced plasma corticosterone and ACTH concentrations in maladaptive, behaviorally symptomatic animals but not in well-adapted or control rats. So essentially, the ones who got really upset when there was a cat nearby are abnormal. So exactly what happens to those normal rats who don't have a response? Yes, that's what happens to them. Um, those rats, in fact, are much better adapted to real life in the real world. Now we have a mystery. Natural selection should shape near-optimal defense regulation mechanisms. But we're plagued by excess anxiety, pain, and sadness, and other things. We often get fevers and cough and nausea that don't seem essential. And we know from general medicine that we can block these things safely. So what's going on? Why are defenses expressed excessively? So now we get into things a little more akin to physics. We have to ask a question, so how should it be designed? The wonderful thing about an evolutionary approach to things is it has theory, real theory, not made up theory. We can ask ourselves, how should defense regulation be regulated? The, the body has to monitor cues associated with danger. And if the cost of the defense is less than the cost of the harm, if the cost of the defense is less than the cost of the harm without the defense minus the cost of the harm with the defense, then set off the defense. So when should you vomit? Whenever the cost is less than the potential benefit. But it's not that simple, is it? For instance, what if there were a small gurring noise like this? Arrgh from behind that podium. It could be a puppy, or it could be a lion. The cue is unreliable. You can't tell for sure whether we should all flee the room or whether we should just pat the pretty puppy. Now we need something called a signal detection analysis. And we have to include the probability that it's actually a lion behind this bench. 
Now, it's the, whenever you express the defense and run from the room, whenever the benefit from running from the room times the probability of harm is greater than the cost of the defense. And we can draw a nice graph of this. You look at the ratio of the cost of the harm to the cost of the defense. Make it practical. How much energy does it take to have a panic attack and run away? Maybe a couple of hundred calories. How much energy does it take to get mauled by a lion? <laughs> That'll lay you up quite a bit. But it's not always that bad. What if the ratio is just 2 to 1? Well, if the ratio is 2 to 1, then you should express that defense whenever the probability that the danger is there is 50% or greater. What about if it's a 5 to 1? Well, if it's 5 to 1, if the cost of the harm is five times greater than the cost of the defense, then you should flee from the room whenever the probability that it's a tiger back there is 20% or greater. What about if it's 20 to 1? You see where we're going with this, don't you? This proved profoundly important for me in my treatment of panic disorder patients. Should you flee from a noise? Is it a monkey or a puppy or a tiger? Cost of fleeing, let's say 200 calories. Cost of not fleeing, if it's a tiger or a lion, 200,000 calories on average. Ratio, 1,000 to 1. What should the system do? The system should initiate flight whenever there is a 1 out of 1,000 chance that it's a lion. Oh my god. No, no it's OK. It's, uh, 99, 999 out of 1,000 panic attacks will be unnecessary, but perfectly normal. I was blown away when I finally figured this out. I mean, it took me a couple of years of gradually thinking about this. But this, I think, is how these mechanisms are regulated. If this guy is, in fact, anywhere in the vicinity, you don't want to be in the vicinity. Why? Uh, my buddy Larry Dill said it better than anybody else. He says, Few failures are as unforgiving as failure to avoid a predator. <laughs> Being killed greatly decreases future fitness. <laughs> George Williams and I coined the term the smoke detector principle to make this more accessible. I mean, many of you this morning made toast, and in the middle of making toast, you heard this nasty noise, you're tempted to throw your smoke detector in the trash, and maybe you have, but most of us put up with that. We put up with a lot of false alarms. Why? Because we want a smoke detector that goes off every single time there's a fire, even though we know this means there are going to be false alarms. And now we do real smoke signal detection theory. Not real, but that's a quick version. Green and Swetch actually did a lot of this work here at the University of Michigan in 1966. We should honor them more for it. It's one of the huge advances in understanding how things work. It's used in large part by electrical engineers and physicists in trying to detect whether that little click on the line is really a signal or whether it's just random static. It depends on how loud it is, right? It can be a real signal, and you say, yep, it's a signal, hit. Another place this is used a lot is when the, we used to have radar watching for Russian planes coming across the North Pole to bomb Detroit. <laughs> if it was a signal of a plane and you responded by <laughs> destroying the world, um, that would be a hit. But you really wanted to avoid, in this case, a false alarm of setting off all those missiles when it was just a flock of geese. A missed response of not responding when it's a real danger is a bad thing. And a correct rejection is recognizing it's a flock of geese. Don't worry about it. But how do you set your threshold? How loud a noise do you need before you flee from this room because there might be a tiger behind? You have two different distributions of sounds. These are the sounds made by a puppy. These are the sounds made by a lion. And you have to figure out at what loudness of sound are you going to flee from the room. If you set your criterion here and flee from everything above here, all of these will be hits, but these will be misses. These will be correct rejections, and these will be false alarms. To actually do the math, you need it to be a little bit more fancy. You actually have to look at the likelihood ratio. I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but it's the height of the signal distribution here for the signal from the real danger divided by the height of the signal from the noise. And that's the number you really need that you're trying to figure out the right ratio in order to figure out exactly at what intensity of signal you want to flee. Part of the issue is how much of a difference there is between those two signals. Here, there are about two standard deviations away from each other, so they're somewhat separable, but there's still a whole lot of overlap. 
these curves are the signal detection curves that show a one standard deviation and a two standard deviation. If there's more information, you can make a better job of, of deciding where to do this. On the other hand, you can set your smoke detector at any place along this curve. You can set your smoke detector so you have lots of false alarms that every single time there's a fire, it'll go off, and vice versa. You could set it so there are fewer false alarms that the price you pay is you're going to miss at about 10% of real fires. This is the formula you use to calculate exactly where you want that criterion to be. The values you take into account are the value of a correct rejection, the value or cost of a false alarm. That's the 200 calories you spend fleeing if there's no lion there. The value of a miss, that is the cost to you if the lion is actually there. Uh, the value of a hit and the value of a rejection. And that you put in the baseline probability of noise versus probability of signal and set a likelihood ratio that fits that. Details another time, but isn't it wonderful to see just that you can calculate where these mechanisms should set the threshold? And not just for fleeing from a lion, but for when you vomit, when you cough, how high your fever gets, how much anxiety you have. This is a very general principle. So if this fellow is coming, you want the threshold set way low. So at least 999 times out of 1,000, you're going to get the heck out of there before he's any place there. A lot of the defenses that we have, however, are not all or none things like panic, not all or none things like vomiting. They're more continuous things like fever, or the amount of anxiety you have, or how often you cough. So how do you figure that out? You need a slightly different analysis. Then the optimum defense amount, like fever, depends on how fast harm declines with increases in the defense. And you want to find the point where the total cost is minimized. This is an abstract presentation of that, a model where the cost of the defense is, I'll, I'll skip all the math there and just show you that as the cost of the defense, as the defense goes up, the cost of the defense goes up linearly, but the cost of the harm declines exponentially. And you sum these two costs, the cost of the defense, such as the cost of fever, and the cost here of, say, the infection. And you get another curve, the total cost here. And lo and behold, the minimum for this curve is exactly where you want to be. And that's where the cost of the harm equals the cost of the defense. And superficially, it seems like you should therefore expect the cost of the defense be kind of equal to the cost of the harm it's protecting against. But it turns out that's one notch too simple. Because in fact, um, if you change the parameters just very slightly and make this come down even faster, you find that the minimum for the total cost is over here. And notice that the cost of the defense is here, and the cost of the harm is lower. This suggests that natural selection will shape certain regulation mechanisms to make the cost of the harm larger than the cost of the thing it's protecting against. And you see things like this all the time. I mean, what's the biggest killer in the world? The biggest killer in the world is diarrhea. And diarrhea is a useful capacity. People who don't have any capacity for diarrhea die very quickly. But unfortunately, it's very hard, because we're in an arms race with other organisms who have their own ideas about how to set these things. Um, it, but the, the, the key here is to realize that a lot of the spent expense Defenses can be very harmful, and it's still perfectly normal, because the marginal benefit of an increased amount of defense is greater than the marginal cost. That pretty much ends the fancy graphs on math. Uh, so how do we regulate these defenses? And this last five minutes is, is speculative, not in the extreme, but it's good speculation. A lot of these defenses get regulated depending on what you experience, right? Um, a good example is one study of people in Japan found that if they were raised in Malaysia where it's even hotter, they had twice as many sweat glands. The, these systems are regulated. And how much anxiety you experience is in part a function of how dangerous your environment is. So if, in fact, you are chased by a lion once in this lecture hall, when you come back, even a small little grrr will make you get out of here very quickly. Uh, because last time you thought it was a puppy and you were wrong. Uh, so it changes the threshold. So what happens when you change these thresholds? I mean, when someone has a panic attack, it changes their threshold and it makes the whole environment seem more dangerous. That makes it more likely that they'll have another panic attack in response to smaller cues. And when they have another panic attack in response to smaller cues, that makes the threshold often go down lower yet 
this is called positive feedback. I understand that you in this hall have actually had experience with positive feedback. Are there any regulars who are here who have some idea of what we're about to experience, if it works the way it's supposed to work? <coughs> oh, drat. When you want feedback, yeah. it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> On other days, it squeals nicely uh, to re illustrate the problem of positive feedback. <laughs> the same thing with immune responses. Your first response to something is intense, but not that intense. Second one faster, third one faster. If it's all regulated just right, you're fine, but anaphylaxis can also result. Nausea and vomiting, um, that one time you drank peppermint schnapps, too much peppermint schnapps, and you couldn't touch any peppermint for the next 10 years, um, it increases your sensitivity. And if you do it again, this turns out to be no funny business for people with cancer chemotherapy, because the first time they get it, it causes some problems, next time more, next time more, next time more. It's not useful, but that's the way that the system is designed to change these thresholds. And likewise for depression. Uh, the first episode, 80% of depressions are precipitated by a life event. They're not so much a result of what the individual's like, but what the environment's like and an interaction. By the fourth episode, uh, precipitants don't make much difference. The syndrome comes on all by itself, no matter what the person is doing in life. We use the metaphor of kindling, as in kindling firewood, a neurological metaphor sometimes. But a more accurate scientific view of this is that this may represent positive feedback with the system adjusting itself to an, an environment that actually is not working very well for the person, such that they more quickly go into low mood and possibly depression on subsequent experiences. What are the implications for this? Well, actually, I think most of general medicine is, in fact, blocking defenses. This is what you go to the doctor, and mostly, in everyday general practice, what you get is an identification of the defense. Hopefully, someone looks for the cause, and then you get some kind of a pill to make you feel better. And it's usually safe, except for the times when it's not safe. And don't you wish the research had already been done? If you'd like to make yourself a real pest to your physician, uh, you just next time you go in and the doctor says, well, just take some Tylenol, reduce your fever, say, yeah, could you just review the research with me, doctor, on the advantages and disadvantages of blocking this normal response? Likewise for pharmacology. Maybe there's someone from Pfizer here or watching on television. In fact, we're developing all kinds of new powers, a lot of which are to block defenses. How will we use them? We will very soon, I predict, have um, substances that block CRH at the very top of the cortisol cascade, and we'll be able to just turn off the stress system. That is going to be a godsend for some people. But do we want to just willy-nilly turn off the stress system, or do we want to think very carefully before we do that? I do think the overall conclusion from this analysis is that most of our suffering and defenses are, in fact, unnecessary in the individual instances. Their false alarms, repeated arousals, changed threshold in modern environments are much safer than older environments. So we should be able to safely block most defenses and suffering and make life better, much better. Except for the one time in 100 when the defense will actually be absolutely essential. The future. This is a pretty safe prediction about the future, actually. Uh, I encourage you to turn to your issue of science next week, where they'll have a very nice editorial titled, Medicine Needs Evolution. And to give you a quick preview, uh, this is an editorial that I wrote with Gilbert Oman and Steve Stearns. Uh, there's, this is a complete, concluding sentence. It says, what actions would bring the full power of evolutionary biology to bear on human disease? We suggest three. First, include questions about evolution and medical licensing examinations. This will motivate curriculum committees to incorporate rele relevant basic science education and nothing else will, I might note. <laughs> um, second, ensure evolutionary expertise in agencies that fund biomedical research. I can assure you they really have no idea at the moment. Third, incorporate evolution into every relevant high school, undergraduate, and graduate course. These three changes will help clinicians and biomedical researchers understand that both the human body and its pathogens are not perfectly designed machines, but evolving biological systems shaped by selection under the constraints of trade-offs that produce specific compromises and vulnerabilities. It's a fundamentally different view of the human body than the one most of us learn in medical school. So quick take-home points. One, defense capacities are useful. I hope I've convinced you of that. Two, the clinician's illusion. They seem like they're defects, but they're not. Three, the smoke detector principle explains why there are so many false alarms. 
And finally, evolutionary biology is just so incredibly cool. Thank you very much. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. <laughs>